Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I'd really like to spend a bit of time looking at the ship and module construction in Children of a Dead Earth. Now, I've definitely been critical of this game in terms of gameplay, but the ship design is something that, while you may have dismissed the rest of the game, the ship design and the module design are really worth looking at, even if you're not interested in playing the game. So, uh, you know, you get the ship design, as you might imagine, is the usual bolting bits together and balancing your fuel and your power and obviously your thermal radiation. That is of no surprise to you, but that's not what really gets. I mean, sure, you have interesting options like spider silk armor. They have many, many types of material modeled in this game. Liquid crystal polymer fiber, graphite aerogel, borosilicate glass, vanadium chromium steel. They don't appear to have that uh, radioactive thorium zirconium magnesium alloy that was used uh, that was proposed for that plane uh, anyway all these modules are they kind of have all their parameters and you can look at how they work but if you go out of here if I cancel out of here and we go to module design module design is where the physics really gets interesting this is where you can actually design all these rockets to actually perform you know to whatever you need so in Kerbal Space Program, right, you take your engine and you design it, or you, you plug it in there, and you're not able to change the parameters under which it operates. In this case, you can adjust your thrust chamber sizes, you can adjust your fuel, and you have to make everything work. So let's actually just take my thrust chamber. Let's make a, a thrust chamber with a 10 millimeter outlet, and we'll make it slightly wider. So we have the contraction ratio is the ratio of the side of the, the thing to the rear of the thing. So this is just, we're blowing fuel in here and it's escaping out of this. And yeah, this is actually working fine. We're throwing in ethylene oxide. It's hitting 1869 Kelvin. The throat constrains it and it hits Mach 1.36 and it escapes. So we're generating 906 meters per second of uh, exhaust velocity. But of course, we can have a nozzle. If you've seen my Kerbal Space Program video about nozzles, you want to uh, do the same thing. You want to have a De Lavalier nozzle that basically allows the gases to expand and see right away, look at that, we've got our velocity up to 8.66, Mach 8.6, and that's only with a really tiny expansion ratio. We're not really getting faster though, and the reason we're not getting much faster is we're not pumping the fuel much faster. Also, the fuel is kind of, you know, not that great fuel. We could try something like LOX and RP-1, right? Which is what the Merlin uses, or we could use, say, LOX methane, like the Raptor. Or you could go into crazy, insane territory and use fluorine hydrogen. Oh yes, the fuel of the future. Something incredibly terrifying and definitely much higher thrust. I'm surprised, I'm disappointed actually, it doesn't offer fluorine hydrogen lithium. Now, another reason my... Now, okay, so we've got some improvements there, but we're still far from perfect because our mixture ratio is not one-to-one, -one, so we're not burning all the fuel. This actually might be okay because hydrogen, unburned hydrogen, has a low molar mass, so let's actually try and improve it. Notice that our exhaust velocity is actually initially went down, right? Because we're, we had a lot of hydrogen in the stream and then we're burning more of it. So the energy goes up, but the combustion product mass goes down. But let's take this all the way over. Once we start hitting one to one, oh yes, we're starting to get some real thrust here. Now, but does it keep going? It starts to go down again. So you've got to find a sweet spot here where your exhaust velocity is maximized. And one to one is probably fine for most people to mess around with. Okay. So we're generating that, uh, we're only getting 637 millinewtons, and the thrust to mass ratio is 108 millijs. So that basically is one tenth of the mass of the rocket. The reason behind this is we're not putting enough fuel into the engine. So we have a fuel pump uh, that we can specify here. Let's make it a little bigger. Let's make it a, a five centimeter fuel injector, and it's rotating at one RPM. Let's make it at least start rotating. Oh. Can we do it at 45 RPM? There, we'll do... <laughs> this, it's a little record rotating. Maybe I should do a 7-inch one. <laughs> this is me being silly. They are 7-inch rotating at almost 45 RPM. It could be an old record. Now, by having a pump... This is silly, these numbers. Don't worry. This is not realistic. 
So now, because we're pumping the fuel in so fast, we're now exceeding the melting point of the chamber. So let's uh, let's try to figure out how to make that better. First of all, we can make the chamber walls thicker, and that will actually contain. So our yield strength will crack from the pressure. Our chamber walls literally aren't strong enough. So we could make the chamber wider. So make that wider. Uh, oh, that's not working. We could narrow it down. Oh, that's still going to crack. Let's make the wall thicknesses a little more. Now, if you mouse over any of these, it will tell you how you can improve things. So they're telling you to adjust the chamber radius. Uh, you can't dissipate heat fast enough. Well, one way we can fix that is by adding regenerative cooling. So, of course, we have all this liquid hydrogen and fluorine. Let's pass it over the engine. But even 100% cooling is not going to help us. And also... Uh, did we get a warning? Yes, we will crack from internal pressure. No, that's not going to work. How about we choose one of those fancy materials? Sure, we could try copper, which may conduct heat better. Or we could try building it out of... We could try building it out of lead, if you like. Or, hey, diamond. Yes, let's have a diamond con uh, combustion chamber on a rocket engine running fluorine and hydrogen. And now we get... Uh, a thrust to mass ratio of 100 and f 105, or sorry, 1050. So this is one th <laughs> a thrust to mass ratio, which is pretty darn amazing. That's pretty awesome. We can maybe increase our expansion ratio a bit, make our thing a bit bigger. It reduces our thrust to mass ratio, but you'll notice that the exhaust velocity increases. So you can adjust all of these things. And this is using real rocket science equations for your throat, uh, your you know, your uh, chamber size, your fuel mixture, your energy. All this stuff is being calculated. And, you know, you might have guessed these kind of things existed, but the game also lets you use these same physics models for other things. For example, you can model cannons. Let's just take this, uh, I don't know, 1200mm cannon, we'll duplicate that. And you'll see, right, it has a barrel which you specified the size of and the thickness and everything. You have a propellant, tells you how much propellant goes, and then you have your projectile. Now, the muzzle velocity for this is 1.73. Maybe we can make the thing fire faster. You see that we have the explosion as the fuel combusts, right? This is the time that it takes for the block of fuel to combust. And then this discontinuity is when the fuel is stopped combusting, so the pressure has stopped rising and the projectile is traveling down the barrel and getting longer and longer. So we could get a little more speed by just increasing the length of the barrel. But of course, once you make the barrel too long, you're going to worry, you're going to have problems with beam deflection stress. So let's make the barrel slightly thicker. And so we've got a little bonus there. Another option we could do is uh, change perhaps the grain radius to slow the combustion, right? So. By slowing the combustion down, uh, what happens, you'll see that the combustion takes longer to happen, and we're still combusting when we're a long way down the barrel, but that does reduce the stress early on. So, of course, we can do it the other way, and, yeah, we get warnings about beam deflection stress. There's so many things to mess with. This is so fun. Let's, let's try building, like, a 35-meter gun. How thick does it need to be? There. 1.77, you know, so there's a lot of options here. Also, you can change your slug type or you can turn it into, you know, make it capable of shooting nuclear weapons. Did I say nuclear weapons? Why? Yes, I did. In case you were wondering, you can in fact build nuclear weapons in this game. Obviously, you're building a model of them. These are all implosion-based fissile weapons with a potential fusile boost. There are no uh, fusion weapons. There's nothing, uh, there's no like teller ulum implosion, you know, devices. They don't model that. These are entirely, uh, you basically you have a core. In this case, the metal, the fissile material is blue. You have a, a reflector plate. You have a fast, ex or sorry, slow explosives fast explosives, and that's how you design your weapon. So, for example, let's just pick, say, Plutonium-239, right? The assembly will not go super critical. You know why? Because I don't have, for one of the reasons, I won't have enough 
stuff in my core, but watch what happens if, as I increase my core at a certain mass, it'll warn. Oh, no, at a certain mass, it won't warn me because my plutonium is not particularly enriched. Let's enrich it up to say, you know, 10% weapons grade. I don't know what weapons grade is, but let's say 10%, right? So that might be enough to just, if I make the core massive enough, it might explode on its own. Uh, oh, there, it will go super critical immediately and spontaneously. So if you just try to put this much plutonium-239 in one place, it will just explode on its own. And so, yeah, it needs 500 kilograms in this case. We, we can uh, get even higher enriched levels, and then that lets us reduce our core mass, right? See that? Now, of course, we can make it, we can actually get a lower mass to, to implode by using this uh, explosive to compress it, right? So the fast explosive, let's uh, make the explosive surrounding it bigger, right? Uh, if we make it big enough, in theory, it could compress the core, but I don't think that's going to work in this case. What you really want to do is have a hollow core so that it picks up some momentum before the thing starts to collapse, right? So let's um, inner explode hollow core radius so that we make a thin shell. Look at this, right? So the plutonium gets compressed by the outer layer, collapses inwards, and then collides, and then should be able to go critical more easily. And this is where I really start to say, I've no idea where I am. Also. Yeah, we should probably have some copper nanothermite. Sure, why the hell not? So what happens is this outer layer distributes the blast front all over this. This is where the explosive lenses are, right? To make sure that the explosive front hits this layer simultaneously. And then this layer fires and collapses inwards. Collapses the core and everything is awesome. Let's actually put a better reflector on. How about we use... Oh yeah, why don't we use diamond again? Oh yes, diamond. We like that stuff. Uh, oh, there we... So now we can implode the core by getting the de delay mass fraction up enough. That's great. Now, if we make it more powerful, can we get it to go super critical? No, we're not getting it to go super critical. We need to make these ratios just right. Oh, and then see if you have too much delay composition here, your assembly will not ignite in the first place. There's a lot of stuff you can mess around with. Uh, octogen. That is, I guess... Oh, there, look! We've got our thing to go super critical. It's only a 24 ton. I'm very far away from optimizing this, but this is a 25 ton device. It's more like a nuclear installation. Okay, so we can also boost the explosion by potentially having a fusion booster in the middle. Let's try deuterium tritium. Uh, 529 tons. We're not doing particularly good here. Let's try boosting this up a bit. Oh, look, you see? Our yield is shooting up because the core is getting compressed down and it starts to fuse and it generates lots of neutrons which makes the fissile stuff go faster. So yeah, you know, you can work on this and this is a terrible design. If you just come back out, the equations offer um, some very strange things. If you just look at this one, uh, this is one I found on the forums. They were able to get a working 500 ton fission device with 52 grams of plutonium 239 at 97% enrichment. It didn't, they didn't have any fusion boost, but the whole mass of the whole thing uh, is 269 grams and it fits in the palm of your hand. So yeah, this is a nuclear hand grenade. I'm thinking that these equations might not be perfect at extreme limits and the game might need some limits on them, but Hey, it's, it's fascinating to watch this stuff. Hey, also, you know, if you want to build fusion rea or sorry, fission reactors, there's no fusion reactors in this game. It's all fission, so it's all using existing stuff. Here is a solid state fission reactor. We have the reactor, you have a reactor cooling loop, which runs over a thermocouple, and then you have a second cooling loop, which uh, runs out to the radiator. So, you know, you can modify all of these things. You can say, make your uh, make your pumps run faster using a different material or anything. You can increase the amount of fuel in, in the fuel enrichment here. The problem is, of course, if you increase the fuel enrichment too much, then uh, as we get over here, it'll warn you that the criticality constant does not span subcritical to supercritical range. You see, to make a controllable reactor, you have to be able to kind of 
move the control rods back and forth so it sits on this exact boundary between subcritical and supercritical. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to do with uh, your fast fissions versus your slow fissions to make sure that you can actually control it at human speeds. Anyway, look, this thing... Oh man, this is uh, one of my favourite things and I'm probably... I've probably spent more time playing with this now than I've spent playing the rest of the game. Uh, <laughs> I haven't really deployed any spacecraft with it. They all seem to be really pushing the limits of silliness, but you know, I thoroughly enjoy it and I'm really glad to see this as a physics sandbox just for modeling existing knowledge. You know, we also have models for uh, rail guns and coil guns and lasers. Uh, you can, all your munitions, you know, your nuclear weapons or nuclear missiles and your drones and everything, those are all miniature spacecraft. So yeah, this is definitely worth checking out if you've kind of bought Children of a Dead Earth and you haven't got through to unlocking this. This is really something to strive for and if you haven't bought the game yet, just wait until they fix some of those crazier bugs with the UI and it'll definitely be worth getting. So yeah, I love this stuff. Thanks to devs for, for really doing this research. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.